Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining today. We're going to wait a few minutes for everyone um, so that all the attendees can join. And I'll probably repeat myself a couple times <laughs> saying that while everyone trickles in. You can all say hi, hi to Emily in the meantime. My bird is here. She's hiding behind me. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to wait a couple minutes for everyone to join the call. Hi, feel free to type in the chat as well where you're joining from. I'm in San Francisco. I'm in the Netherlands. Oh, hi, Paula. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes for everyone to trickle in. And some folks are typing in the chat where they're joining from as well. So feel free to type that in if you want to. Alrighty, so I think we have a critical mass of people on the call. So I just wanna welcome everyone to our third ACE community chat. First off, thanks so much for taking the time to join us on your Sunday. Today's chat is focused on the topic of ACE movement grants. I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Becca, ACE's visual communications manager, and I'll be acting as a facilitator for today's event. I'd also like to introduce our communications director, Erica Alonzo, who will help me moderate the Q&A. <laughs> um, and finally, we have one presenter with us, ACE Movement Crants Program Officer, Mariana Vanderwerf. Um, so before we get started, I'll just quickly go over a few housekeeping items so that you know what to expect and how to participate in today's chat. There's two parts to today's event. First, we'll start with a presentation by Mariana. After that, will be the Q&A session. Uh, to submit questions to our presenter, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom right of the Zoom control panel. And if you'd like to remain anonymous, there is a checkbox. Um, so please remember to indicate this by selecting the anonymous checkbox prior to submitting your question if you'd like it to be anonymous. Um, and I just want to note that while you're welcome to submit any questions that you have for our presenter, we're going to try to prioritize responding to the questions that are most closely related to today's topic of ACE movement grants. Mariana will address as many questions as time permits during the live Q&A. And you may also participate in the chat um, where we'll be sharing relevant links and resources. Uh, one more thing to note is that the event is being recorded, so if you aren't able to stay for the entire time or want to rewatch it at a later date, don't worry. Um, all registrants will be getting an email with the link to the video recording later this week. And if you're experiencing any technical issues during the event, please um, click on the Zoom support button. Hopefully we won't encounter any technical problems, but Thank you for your patience and understanding um, if we do. And now without further ado, I'd like to introduce ACE Movement Grants Program Officer, Mariana Vanderwerf. Thanks, Mariana. You can... Thank you, Rebecca. Yes, so my name is Mariana uh, and I'm the Program Officer of um, Movement Grants, the grant program of Animal Charity Evaluators. Before we begin, I'd like to do a quick land acknowledgement um, because this is a webinar, it's taking place all over the world. 
um, including many uh, places that are unceded territories of countless tribal nations and indigenous people. And so as we begin this event, we acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions. And this is adapted from the California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center. A quick agenda for today. Uh, first, I will give uh, some basic overview of the movement grant so far. Uh, I'll be going through some uh, recent grant recipients so you can get an understanding of what the typical grant recipients look like. Um, and I will be going over the application process, what it will look like uh, this round, uh, so what you can expect. And the second half of this event will be a Q&A and discussion. And we got some um, pre-submitted questions uh, in the application form. Um, will, you can also uh, submit questions like Becca just explained. Um, so Movement Grants uh, was started in 2018, and at the time it was called the Effective Animal Advocacy Fund. We renamed it uh, last fall. We, uh, we, had, we have currently four rounds completed. This is the fifth round um, that we just started. And uh, in the past uh, four rounds, we received over 350 applications and we gave out over 100 grants to recipients in 30 different countries. The grants are, uh, the smallest grant that we give out is 4,000 US dollars. The largest one is, uh, has been so far has been uh, $60,000, uh, but the mean size of the grant, typical size is um, $20,000. Uh, we have one round per year. We used to have two rounds per year, but we switched it to one round. Uh, so this, um, the current round closes for applications March, March 12th. And the next one after that will be um, next year in the beginning of 2022. So we also close donations for this round on uh, March 12th as well. So if you want to support the, the, um, uh, the program and support any of the grantees that we will um, be funding this year, uh, make sure that is in before March 12th as well. So an overview of why we started Movement Grants. Um, the mission of animal charity evaluators as a whole uh, has always been to, uh, to find and to promote the most effective ways to help animals. Historically, we have done this via the charity evaluations. This is a program where we, uh, we research organizations in depth and we publish our donation recommendations. So where individual donors, where we think uh, are the most effective uh, giving opportunities. We have different criteria for this. We update that every year, um, but they roughly include like the organization needs to do good work, have a healthy work culture, but also we need to have confidence in the organization's ability to continue to do good work in the future. And that the charity also has more room for more funding because this is a donation uh, recommendation. So where people need to donate or recommend to donate. So if they don't have room for more funding, we don't need to recommend people uh, to donate to those organizations. Uh, a byproduct of these criteria is that the more established larger charities are also more likely to come out on top. This is because they usually have more plans for growth and more opportunities for growth. And also they have had more opportunity to build up a track record. So we have more confidence in their ability to, to continue to do good in the future. So even though we feel most confident that these are the charities that are the most promising uh, giving opportunities, we don't believe that all funding in a movement should go towards these charities. Uh, we believe that a more uh, broad pluralistic movement is more effective and more resilient in the long term than having only a limited set of charities or a limited set of interventions that we do. Um, another reason is that we, uh, for diversifying the, diversifying the movement is that we have limited evidence to begin with. What is the, um, uh, what is the most effective intervention? Uh, so that is also a good reason to support multiple approaches. And this is why we started Movement Grants in the end of 2018. The way that Movement Grants uh, complements our charity evaluation program is by giving out one-time grants. Uh, one-time grants to promising groups that don't necessarily meet all of the criteria for a recommended charity, uh, recommended charity status. This can mean that they're newer, so they don't have a track record yet, or they're smaller, so they don't have a lot of room for more funding. 
This model allows us to support uh, a wider variety of groups and support approaches uh, that are uh, higher risk, higher reward, and thereby we can diversify the movement and make it more uh, effective and resilient in the long term. Some of the grant recipients do uh, grow into organizations that we end up evaluating and recommending. Um, the examples where this happened was uh, FIAPO, Vegetarianos Oe, uh, Esre Animali, and Wild Animal Initiative. They received a, a movement grant in the past, and then we later we ended up evaluating them and recommending them as a recommended charity. Um, so it does happen that there's overlap uh, or that the charity grow, uh, grant recipient grows into um, a recommended charity, but it, it doesn't, it really doesn't need to um, be, and it's not something that we're uh, actively looking out for. Uh, there are many groups that we don't expect will ever be good candidates for our charity evaluation process, and that is exactly why we support them via movement grants. Uh, an example could be like uh, a one-time thing, like making a book or a documentary uh, that is just not going to be a recommended charity, but is a good funding opportunity. Um, so organizations that we support via movement grants are often small or newer organizations. Uh, there may be a group of volunteers who are taking the first step to hire people uh, as paid staff, or there may be a group of uh, uh, experienced animal advocates uh, who are starting a new, new organization or um, um, a project that naturally requires a set amount of resources, such as um, a documentary or a book. Uh, so next, let's get over. Let's um, go over some of the the recent uh, grant recipients, people who have received or organizations who have received uh, grants from movement grants in the past. This is Arvind Animal Activist. Uh, this is a social media account by Arvind Cannon and his partner, and they produce videos uh, adjacent to veganism and promote them on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. They primarily target an Indian audience who speaks Tamil uh, or English. This is Sneha Sresva, the founder of Sneha Scare. And she's speaking at an animal welfare event that Sneha Scare organized. Uh, we supported the project of theirs on animal welfare legislation in Nepal, which is where Sneha Scare is based. Uh, Sneha Scare translated animal protection legislation in uh, several regional languages, and this is to uh, make the legislation more accessible to more Nepalese advocates. And they also organized several workshops and seminars uh, before COVID, well, this was before COVID, uh, to bring people together in um, politics, media, and religion uh, to work on strengthening animal, um, animal welfare in Nepal. This is a uh, researcher and writer, Perla Anarol Cifuentes Garcia. She is writing a book uh, about animal activism in Mexico. She analyzes and describes the growth movement um, in Mexico. And in the book, she will educate activists on topics such as effective activism uh, and burnout in a movement. Um, the book will also discuss an overlap um, that the animal advocacy movement has with other uh, movements such as uh, environmentalism and human oppression uh, and this is to uh, we believe this is promising to help build alliances between those move between the movements um, we think that because of the more general chapters this is also uh, will be useful for other uh, spanish-speaking uh, people who are not necessarily in mexico there's a seed uh, strategies for ethical and environmental development um, Seed works in the US and in Brazil, and it promotes a uh, transition to more equitable, ethical, and sustainable food systems. Um, and that will be good for all uh, animals, including for humans. They started only last year, and this is an example of an organization that is started by more experienced animal advocates, but it's a completely new uh, project. Uh, in October 2020, they published their first campaign, which was uh, publishing undercover investigations of um, cow auctioneers in Texas. Uh, we are very excited about these projects, because, especially because they promote a representation, equity, and inclusion of marginalized humans 
in their work, which we believe is very important for strengthening the movement um, and um, making sure the movement is successful in the long run. The next organization is Free, Freedom and Respect for Everything Earthling. This is a Romanian organization. They do different things, including um, vegan outreach, cage-free campaigns, and humane education. Um, with this grant, they, uh, the, the grant went towards um, hiring a fundraiser uh, um, who could, um, with the goal of making the organization free more self-sufficient. We believe that uh, Romania is relatively neglected within the animal advocacy movements, which is where we were excited to support this project. And we also really liked about Free that they um, specifically invest in their employees and volunteers. And they do this via trainings on things like planning, problem solving, um, giving feedback, uh, problem um, or conflict resolution. Um, because we believe that by investing in the people in the movement, um, the, the movement will be stronger in the long term and also more sustainable, um, which is what we especially appreciated about free. The next organization is Black Fetch Fest. This organization was started by Omowali Adwale and addresses social justice issues uh, relating to both the oppression of humans and non-human animals. Black Fetch Fest was um, they organized their first uh, festival in uh, 2018 as a way to support Black vegans whose interests are uh, not, were not represented at many other vegan events. Since then, um, Black Fetch Fest has expanded beyond festivals, and now their projects include uh, projects such as uh, Seven Points of Allyship for the White Vegan Community in Defense of Black Lives. Um, they published this uh, last summer during the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, they also have a series of uh, talks and interviews featuring uh, on their Black Fetch Us Breakout podcasts. And there's a forthcoming book, Brother Vegan, which is a collection of essays by Black vegan men, uh, which is edited by uh, Omowali Adwale. We believe that um, Collaboration between progressive social movements is very uh, important, but also very neglected in the movement. Uh, so that's why we were particularly excited about this project. The last organization I'm going to talk about today is um, Animal Advocacy Careers. They seek to address the career and talent bottlenecks in, within the movement. Currently, they offer support uh, for those who want to maximize their career and. Uh, uh, maximize impact through their career. Um, they also do research into um, what are the, the different um, uh, bottlenecks in animal advocacy movement. And they also have a job board on their website, uh, which is uh, useful for people who are looking for a job in a the movement. They have a place uh, where they can go and see all the jobs collected. Um, like I said before, we think it's important to invest in the skills of animal advocates um, and we believe that that should be a priority in the movement. And more specifically, we really appreciate animal advocacy careers um, foc uh, focus on uh, management and leadership skills. You can read uh, a lot more, um, a lot more grant, uh, about the grant recipients uh, on our blog. We post announcement blog post after each round. So there are four on their website right now, uh, and you can find them um, in our blog section, and you can read about these ones and other organizations that we support it. So as you can see, we have um, a wide variety um, in our grant recipients. So to ensure that all organizations have the opportunity to apply, uh, we have an open application process. So everyone can send in uh, the application form. Uh, it is currently open and will close on March 12th. When all the applications are in, the review committee, uh, which consists of ASD members, uh, will go uh, through the applications and we review between 10 and 20 applications per day. This means we read the application and we take notes privately. Uh, and then we discuss them in a meeting with all the review committee members. And we discuss them privately first uh, to be less influenced by each other's thinking. 
And we also tried to group the 10 to 20 applicants um, roughly by similarity. And this, this is a way to allow us to go through all of them systematically and support the ones that we find most promising. Uh, we used to have criteria such as um, what uh, region the organization was working in, um, some uh, like what group of animals they were focusing on, um, different things like that. But we found that because the organizations that apply and that we want to support are so varied, it was very difficult um, to, uh, to have criteria that really captured what we were trying to compare. So that is why we have a more um, open um, review process where it's more about our notes that we make and our um, uh, comparing um, somewhat similar applications against each other. So what we look for during this review process um, we write a bit about that on the website, on our apply for funding page, we have a section of what we are more likely and less likely to fund, and this is uh, roughly based on uh, the notes that we take during the review process, and also uh, what kind of feedback I find myself most often giving to um, either successful or unsuccessful applicants. Um, so the more details on their website, but roughly what we're looking for is uh, what the uh, whether the problem that the project or group works on um, aligns with how ACE prioritizes problems. Often this means a focus on factory farming, and especially on uh, chickens or fishes or invertebrates such as insects, uh, because these groups are so large and uh, um, have so many individuals in them. We also look at whether we understand the strategy that an organization uh, chooses. Um, that's why we have a question in our application form, whether the applicant has uh, considered other strategies and why they chose this strategy that they're uh, going with. And for strategy, we usually prefer a more institutional scope. For both the strategy and um, uh, problem, we have a preference for uh, projects that are somehow neglected or underfunded. And this can be a region where the movement is still new or uh, an approach that has received relatively uh, little attention. We also appreciate uh, capacity building projects. Um, uh, many, I think many of the uh, of the grant recipients that I discussed previously have an element of capacity building in them. Uh, so capacity can be uh, like free did like hiring a fundraiser to make their organization more self-sufficient. Um, someone who can uh, like work at your organization and um, uh, get in uh, get in donations. Um, so that would be uh, uh, capacity building on a on an organization level. Uh, we also um, appreciate projects that are working on capacity building on the movement level, such as uh, what, uh, what um, Animal Advocacy Careers does with um, get it, uh, looking at the, the bottlenecks and the um, uh, career bottlenecks in the movement or um, uh, other projects that are bringing more skills and resources in the movement. For all these aspects, we're mostly looking at the overall uh, strategy of the organization. Uh, if we believe that the organization is working on one of the most urgent issues uh, and working on it in a very strategic, well thought out way, uh, within that, we don't have a preference for whether we support um, operational versus programmatic um, work. And we encourage organizations to apply for the part of their work that they believe is in most need of funding. Um, so I explained before um, the, uh, the first stage of the application process, which is the, um, the application form and reviewers reviewing like 10 and between 10 and 20 applications per day. Um, so applications close March 12th. And after that, we uh, will take three weeks to do this review process. 
So, and, and after that, uh, in the beginning of April, uh, we will reach out to all the applicants about the next steps. And that can either be that the application was unsuccessful and then we want to let groups know as soon as possible. Um, or it can be that we have follow-up questions and then we will ask them uh, over email or over a call. This is the first time that we're experimenting with this two-stage process. Uh, so we have less certainty of what the second stage looks like in terms of how many uh, applicants will pass through the second stage. Um, the reason for why we have a second stage process now instead of just a, a one stage process where we ask all the questions up front. Um, there are multiple reasons for that. One is that um, some of the questions we think it may take more uh, time for the applicants to respond to them. Uh, like they need to like uh, phrase it in a, in a certain way or they need to collect some information. And we also, we only want to put that, that burden on applicants who we think are, um, uh, who we think are likely to be a good fit. Uh, so we don't want to ask them of all applicants. Uh, another reason is that we can tailor the questions uh, that we ask applicants more to the specific applicant. Um, and we can ask specific questions about um, like what the part, uh, what the part of the process of, of their work is they were most interested in um, and ask them to elaborate on what we're uncertain about. Um, and we think this is more effective than asking everyone the same question. Um, so at the beginning of April, um, we hope to let applicants know whether they're onto the second round. Then uh, we will take uh, two weeks for apl applicants to provide any follow-up um, uh, response to our follow-up questions. Uh, and then we will uh, review uh, those answers. And in the beginning of May, we hope to let applicants know whether they're through to the due diligence round. And we only, um, this is only for applicants that we are pretty confident that we would like to fund them. And uh, during the due diligence round, we request uh, information such as financial statements, uh, charity registration documents, um, names and information about uh, all board members. Um, and we require all the information that uh, we want, uh, that we need uh, to be compliant with US law and also uh, for us to be confident that we can grant to these organizations. We are aware that this can be a laborious process for many uh, organizations, especially for smaller organizations who may not yet have uh, needed to go through this process before or need to collect these information in the um, way that ACE needs. So that's why we, uh, and we also need to have them uh, translated into English if they aren't already. Um, this is why we reimburse costs up to 500 US dollars um, for that organizations make to gather and translate the documents. When organizations pass our due diligence uh, process, we require them to sign a grant agreement that lays out how the organization can spend the funds. And this is in discussion with the, with the group or the project, um, of course. And after a couple of months, uh, we will uh, follow up with a questionnaire that asks how the organization spent the funds, um, if they had any challenges and what, if anything, they learned throughout the process. And we report about these updates on our blog uh, to keep our audience informed. And there are, some, there are two other programs that um, many people on the call may be interested in um, that have deadlines coming up soon. Uh, one is ProVeg. They have a deadline uh, that is tomorrow, so it may be a bit late, uh, but the next one is June 1st. And there's also effective altruism funds, uh, and you can uh, apply by next week or by June 13th. Um, the um, uh, movement grants uh, for the current round, uh, the applications are open, uh, you can find it on our website. Our, our um, deadline for applications is the end of March 12th. Uh, and we have one, uh, we wanted to make clear, we have one round of funding or call for applications per year. So uh, don't miss this one, otherwise uh, you'll have to wait until next year. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you can always reach out to me, my email is here, mariana at animalcharityevaluators.org. 
Um, and uh, a reminder that the deadline is uh, March 12th, uh, so don't forget to apply. Thank you so much, Mariana. Um, so now we're gonna open up the floor for questions. As a reminder, we're gonna prioritize uh, movement grants <laughs> related questions. Um, and to reduce the likelihood of technical problems, all attendees are muted. Um, so please do use the Q&A function at the bottom um, of Zoom. And we will start delving into your questions here. Um, it looks like we already have 11, so that's great. Um, so Thomas, is asking, do you know how much funding in total is available this year? Can you confirm that the next round is planned to be in the first quarter of 2022? So. The amount of funding we will, um, we will, uh, 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 how do you say? Like we will check the amount of funding that we have available uh, at the moment that we close applications. So it's not completely sure how, um, how how much funding we have already, um, but uh, like how much uh, how much funding we will disperse, um, but um, yes. And for your second part of the question, that is correct. It will be in the uh, in the first quarter of twenty twenty two. Thanks. Awesome. Um, let's see. Um, so an, the next question is from an app, a potential applicant who's planning on holding an in-person event in the UK in November, and they're wondering if COVID restrictions are no longer in place during that time, would that type of project be considered for funding? Yeah, that is a, is a difficult question, especially not knowing what the event will look like. Uh, we definitely consider all the applications like I don't I don't think there's anything uh, that would us like immediately like uh, not consider uh, an application we also we always look at like the different different factors involved and how likely we think uh, yeah it's difficult to predict of course like how what the situation will be in November um, we had the, the same actually like last year when we had I think our current our, our last Last year round was just like right in the in in all the like confusion and the lock like the first lockdowns and uh, other situations. So that was, um, yeah, also difficult to to figure out. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm afraid I I don't have uh, a good answer to that. Um, I think there's also a difference between like what kind of in person event it is. It could be if it's just a meeting or like. Um, uh, like an um, uh, like humane education, like giving a lecture. Uh, I think those would be very different than uh, like a festival with hundreds of people. Um, but yeah, it is uh, hard to uh, hard to um, uh, say beforehand. James is asking: Has ACE facilitated any collaboration between organizations and or grantees? That could be really interesting. Yeah, uh, we haven't. Um, I think, like, I think maybe like on a uh, more informal level, we, uh, of course, we the, having many different uh, grant recipients that we stay uh, in touch with allows us to um, like uh, uh, make introductions between people or sometimes um, we get an application that we think is not a good fit for ACE, but we think, oh, that could be a really good contact for this organization. Um, so not on like a, uh, it's not one of the goals, but I think it's like a, a byproduct of um, um, giving out grants and being uh, connected to many different organizations. Uh, Nicholas is wondering, or is saying movement grants are awarded either to incorporated organizations or to individuals working in the US. The website mentions that individuals outside the US could find a fiscal sponsor or reach out to Mariana to discuss options for funding. Does the latter just mean that Mariana might help us find a fiscal sponsor or are there ways to fund individuals slash unincorporated micro NGOs? Yeah, that is, um, 
I, I would uh, be able to help uh, find a fiscal sponsor. Um, of course, cannot uh, promise that, but maybe I, I know of an organization who um, may be able to do that. Um, so it is not just limited to uh, registered organizations uh, that we are able to give out funding for. It's also larger, um, it's a bit broader than that, uh, like companies could also uh, apply uh, and for some situations that would just work better um, to do it that way. Um, Tristan is wondering um, if you could speak more about um, focusing on invertebrates, uh, invertebrates, which you mentioned um, is do uh, weighted more heavily at times because of the vast numbers of them. And he's asking, does he have a particular stance on the likely likelihood of invertebrates sentience or um, how would you justify this focus given the uncertainty? Mm, that's a good question. Um, we don't have an official stance, I believe. I don't think we ever published something on that. Um, it is something that we discuss often, like that often comes up. Um, and I think, um, so, so my personal my personal view on that is is that it's uh, it seems uh, like there's evidence that some uh, kind of infer of course there are so many invertebrates it uh, it's difficult to say anything about them as a whole group but there is evidence that uh, some well studied invertebrates like um, um, cockroaches or bees uh, and ants uh, have some level of consciousness um, and. I think my prior would also be that it that it's likely that it's more likely than not a day of consciousness because uh, just of how similar they uh, they move through the world as other animals like they also um, avoid pain are looking for food so that those stimuli of um, avoiding pain uh, like avoiding damage to the body causes pain uh, I think that makes it more likely um, that they um, can have experiences. Um, but yeah, then I think even if 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 you consider the the likelihood that they can have uh, consciousness to be uh, like just one percent, uh, it's still such an enormous enormous group um, who are uh, being uh, affected by by pesticides, by other kinds of um, uh, um, interactions with humans, uh, also animals such as shrimps or other uh, animals, and sometimes uh, the question of uh, how likely it is that insect farming will take off. Um, there are, uh, yeah, it, it's just, um, the, the scope of it is, is so uh, just really, uh, really big. Um, it's, um, yeah, but it's, you, it's a good question. Okay, so Lacey is wondering, has ACE ever funded or would it consider funding projects with a narrow geographic focus, but with the potential to influence a more national US conversation about effective animal advocacy? For context, I serve on the board of a wildlife organization that has a local focus in Northern Colorado, USA, but has a very unique ethic toward wildlife compared to all other wildlife organization with which I'm familiar. Some of the organization's materials are shared nationally in the US as a result. Yeah, I think uh, that would definitely be something uh, we would consider. Uh, I think it's difficult to answer these types of questions because there are often so many, many different factors in, in this. Like, I don't think there is, uh, yeah, like I said before, like there are specific criteria that we can say, like uh, if you take this box, then we can, uh, then we will um, uh, fund the project. Or if you take this box, it means you're not eligible for uh, funding. Uh, I think if there is a specific um, uh, project that someone is working on that uh, someone thinks is like, uh, like, like somehow on the website, it sounds like we won't be able to fund it, but you think it is uh, it is actually really effective. And then I think it makes sense to like elaborate specifically on that. Like we recognize that it it, it is listed that um, ACE has a preference for an institutional focus, but we think because of these reasons, 
uh, that this project would be more effective if, if it doesn't have an institutional focus. Great. Uh, Craig is wondering, as part of the application form slash process, do you accept uh, supporting documents such as program overview in a Google Sheet, et cetera? I accept those and I uh, I will link them to the I actually link them to the to the application, uh, but we don't require the um, uh, review committee to read through all of those. Uh, I think that just has to do with the capacity uh, that some organizations, uh, when you say that we will accept supporting documents, they will have uh, a lot of supporting documents and we just don't have the capacity to uh, go through all of those. Uh, but yeah, in, in general, I, I uh, definitely appreciate when organizations do that. Uh, so we just have more context and when we are uncertain about something maybe we don't need to ask the organization that but we can just look it up in the supporting documents so yeah i would definitely encourage people to um, send those uh, if they're available jack is wondering what is your read of the grants and groups you funded so far in china how's the progress that's a good question um yeah we uh, supported in china um, the um, um, oh God, I'm blanking on the name now. Um, but yeah, I like the, the, um, uh, a vegetarian organization in China. Uh, I think they're doing uh, um, uh, good work. Um, I'm, uh, I don't think we have, this is an organization that we have uh, um, sent a follow-up survey to yet. Um, but I would have to uh, I would have to look that up. Great, we will follow up on that. Jack. Jose is wondering for the purposes of ACE movement grants, what is the relevance given to EAA groups in EU member countries compared to EAA groups or other approaches operating in higher production and more neglected countries? On this basis, what relevance? might be given to work in the EU uh, area this year when the European Commission is reviewing farmed animal welfare standards, including fish welfare, in view of the possibility of a mirror effect on legislation in neglected countries? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and it's also so difficult to answer. Um, like how we weigh those things, uh, I, I think it, it definitely sounds uh, that type of work um, um sounds really promising and uh we have supported organizations in the past that are um um that are working in a region where animal advocacy is already um relatively advanced uh meaning it's it's like better than uh, in other places of the, of the world um but we have um supported those projects uh, because they had the ability to uh, push animal uh, animal welfare legislation even further, or um, um, uh, have a um, uh, like um, a leadership role or uh, a mirror effect, uh, like the uh, question asked um, said. Um, so I think that is definitely something that we that we weigh uh, and uh, that we appreciate. Um, also the. Um, the, the specific time uh, uh, in the in the bigger context, if an, if a specific country or the EU is like working on updating things, and an organization has a specific project to uh, to be working towards influencing that, uh, that is definitely something we um, uh, that sounds very promising. Uh, I think there's a diff. Um, there's also a difference between like whether an organization will be directly working on that or whether they will be just doing that general um, animal advocacy research, um, animal advocacy work that doesn't necessarily have to do with that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to answer like how we will weigh that against each other, but that's something we, we would uh, see as positively. Great, thanks. Um, Craig said, you mentioned animal advocacy careers. Um, if I can use them in a, as an example of a service which supports the animal movement without conducting firsthand campaigning, lobbying, et cetera, is ACE likely to consider applications to establish similar service roles such as translation? There's a big need for this across Asia, thanks. 
Yeah, I think that sounds like a, like a capacity building project, like using um, uh, skills and um, position to uh, support other organizations that may not have that um, expertise uh, uh, in-house. I think that make def um, that definitely makes sense to um, have, uh, like for different things, I think that makes sense to have an organization um, uh, or a project uh, um, working on, on something like that that could support many different organizations. Um, Maya is wondering, should the time frame of our submitted interventions be January through December 2022? Um, I don't think so. Um, we, uh, um, we usually try, uh, so I was thinking about the previous rounds. I think in the previous rounds uh, for movement grants, we had two rounds per year. And we would um, uh, look at the timeline, like basically between the rounds. And if it was closer to the, if it was uh, like maybe a month or three be, uh, after the uh, after the next round, we would encourage applicants to apply in the next round instead of in the current round. Um, so I think the timeline for project would be something like um, June, July, twenty twenty one to. Um, December um, 2021, or like maybe uh, probably later actually. Um, yeah, just um, around a year uh, from now. Great, um, let's see. Wow, so many great questions. Uh, okay, Anonymous is uh, wondering, Oh, this is a pre-submitted question. Uh, is the question um, in the application about alternative approaches to achieving our goals referring to project goals or funding goals? It's related to project goals. Uh, the goal with that question is to understand why the organization chose that specific approach. Uh, and we've been thinking about, uh, we've been thinking a lot about how to improve the application process. So we can better understand the overall strategy of an organization. Uh, so I think um, we had some other questions that we um, uh, that we uh, considered instead of this question, and they would be something like, um, uh, "Why do you think this specific approach is the best way to achieve your goal?" Uh, or do you have like? Um, uh, uh, like a theory of change or what kind of strategy, strategical thinking are you using? And we decided on this question um, to uh, like more like get at that um, uh, strategic, um, un understand better the strategic thinking of the organization. Uh, and we would have more uh, in-depth questions uh, and ask if charities have a more uh, theory of change that they can share or uh, some other kind of analysis or strategic uh, tools that they use. Um, we decided to do that more in the, in the second stage because uh, we realized that that can uh, take more effort to um, uh, put together. Great. Uh Margarita was wondering, how long does it take to process an application? Um, that's a good question. Um, let me see. I had a timeline written up here. Yeah, so we, um, like how, how long it takes to, uh, the whole application process. Um, we will close applications uh, March 12th. Then we take three weeks for a review. And we get back to applicants at the beginning of April. Uh, and let them know uh, whether their, um, their application was unsuccessful or whether we have follow-up questions. Then we have uh, two weeks for the applicants to submit those follow-up questions uh, or the responses to that or to schedule a call with me uh, or with my colleagues. And then in the beginning of, at the beginning of April, we want to let applicants know whether they are through to the due diligence round. Um, Give applicants three weeks to collect this information and after that we will confirm and disperse the grants um, 
by the end of May or the beginning of June. Uh, and also, I, I want to say that it's, uh, of course, planning is always uh, um, difficult. Uh, so put more weight on the, uh, uh, the the deadlines that I said that are earlier are more like set in stone than the ones that are um, uh, later. Thank you, Mariana. Um, so let's see. I want to be mindful of the time. So we said <laughs> this webinar would um, go until 11.45. Um, but please let me know, Mariana, if you want to answer uh, one last question or. Yeah, sure. OK, let's see. Um, OK, so. Matai says, at the end of your new form, there's a question about our preference between having a better chance of being funded or having the full amount requested. Is this a survey intended for you to decide this for all applications as a whole, or might this change your assessment of a particular application based on the answer given? That's a good question. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of um, uh, kind of both. Uh, so this is something that we have been discussing. Um, like I've been talking a lot about like capacity building and like that we appreciate a sustainable, uh, that we want to encourage a sustainable culture in animal advocacy. Um, but then at the other hand, we also often uh, find ourselves giving out grants that are smaller than that the applicant had asked for. Because sometimes we, um, uh, we want to fund, we get so many great applications, we want to, <laughs> we want to fund all of them. Um, uh, it, it's just difficult to, um, uh, yeah, there's so many promising applications and we like to see them, like them all make progress. Um, and uh, so that's been a question that we have uh, considered of whether we should uh, commit to giving the full amount that applicants ask for and then give out uh, fewer grants uh, or give out, um, uh, keeping giving out smaller grants so we can support uh, more different kind of projects. Uh, so with this question, um, I think it does. Uh, it would impact like the specific uh, apl applicants that um, that it um, uh, who responded to that question. Uh, like if we consider like how big uh, that specific uh, grant would be, uh, we would look at that question. But we would also consider it more general. Like if all applicants like answer in a specific way. Um, that would also, or if most applicants answer in a specific way, that would also inform our, um, our grant making. Great. Um, oh, and one last question from Jasmina. What percentage of the fund can be spent for salaries or administration? Um, all of it can be spent on uh, salaries or administration. Yeah, we don't have a preference for uh, operational uh, support or programmatic support. Uh, realize that it can be more difficult to get operational support sometimes. Uh, so we, uh, we're kind of looking to understand the overall strategy of the organization and what kind of projects uh, they're working on. Um, and then within that, we don't, uh, we don't have a preference for whether we fund uh, that specific project like printing flyers or something or uh, the salary of the, um, of the person handing out the flyers or organizing that. Great. Um, well, there's more questions than we can possibly <laughs> get to before the end of this webinar, but we will do our best to follow up um, with those of you who um, submitted additional questions. Um, and I just wanted to thank you so much, Mariana, um, and thank you to everyone for joining us um, for this community chat on ACE Movement Grants. Um, and a few days from now, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording of this event, so you can watch it again or share it with others. When you leave this webinar, you'll be directed to take a post-event survey. Um, we would very much appreciate it if you could leave us feedback on how we can improve for future ACE community chats. And of course, you can always contact 
us directly via email or through our website with any follow-up questions or comments you have for us. And like I said, we will um, try to get to all of your excellent questions um, that we didn't get a chance to get to within the course of this webinar. Um, we so look forward to seeing you at our next ACE Community Chat and um, have a great Sunday. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Mariana. Thank you, Becca. Thanks, everyone.